Hello, thank you for coming. So I'll talk about designing gameplay with a theme in mind and how, how I utilize it to conjure mood out of systems and numbers. It's also a study of design problems that came up when, you, when we assumed that theme comes first. So I've been designing games for almost 13 years now and I recently co-founded a new company, Artificer. Previously, I was the lead designer of games like Phantom Doctrine and Hard West, and before that, I worked at Techland, did multiplayer design for all of Quar's, uh, all Call of Quar's games, uh, except the good one. Uh, so I was told I'm supposed to have a talk agenda at the beginning, but mine is like, uh, it's really bad. So briefly, here's what to expect. As you can see, it's about uh, themes, uh, themes, systems, and themes. So I'll be talking using examples mostly from our latest game, Phantom Doctrine. Phantom Doctrine is a, a strategic turn-based espionage thriller set at the peak of the Cold War. And we've received some high notes, including a nine out of 10 from GameSpot, got a decent meta and user score, respectively 74 and 73. And occasionally I will compare Phantom Doctrine with our previous game called Hard West. It sold over 400,000 copies. Hardware was, has got 44 Metacritic reviews, which in this league is a lot, at least like two times more than average. And similarly, uh, decent meta and user score, respectively 74 and 77. So here's how fun, uh, Hardware West stacks against Phantom Doctrine. Phantom took almost twice as long by twice the team, and it seems quality-wise it's exactly the same thing. So throughout this talk, I'll also try to answer the question, uh, what the hell? Uh, strong theme and mood have been listed as major positive in over 90% of press reviews for both games. However, it occasionally exploded. So here's how, theme and scope. So the main kind of feedback we got for Hard West was no territory management, no base building, no character development, so basically not XCOM enough. So in Phantom Doctrine, we added all that, increased the budget, increased the time, increased the scope. It has base management, world map, character development. It just, just like XCOM, it has multiplayer that no one ever plays. And all the systems and features were there to support the theme. And all systems are very interconnected and so we did encounter a lot of problems when we wanted to cut down and scale down some of the features. Cutting meant that the theme and the structure might fall apart. So in order to preserve your theme and structure and still be able to modify scope, uh, you should start building features in a modular way. So we start with defining the minimum viable project, MVP for short, and uh, that is like the smallest possible version of a feature that still does the job. And we treat all other ideas that come to mind, and obviously there are a lot, as expansion modules that may or may not be implemented. This way you don't risk damaging your theme and you don't risk your structure falling apart because instead of cutting out features, you can scale them down a lot. The consequence of uh, thoroughly implementing your theme is that it can explode in your face once again. So to talk about this, I'll start with explaining a system that is called sidesteps. So way back in the day, in classic XCOM, you could accidentally run straight into your enemy. And accidents like that are not very tactical. In general, strategic and tactical gameplay is about how you handle information. So you need information to be able to play tactically. So nowadays characters, in most games like this, characters stick to cover, peeking out, it's called sidestepping. However, that doesn't solve everything. Consider a single tile of hedge, right? And hedge isn't cover, so there are no cover sidesteps. If this was indeed solid cover, sidestep, sidesteps would work, characters would peek and would see each other. So we added what we call the free side steps, characters can peek not only when sticking to cover, but anytime, anywhere, in any direction. Now, given that Phantom Doctrine, being a Cold War spy thing, is predominantly interior-based, 
This solved a lot of unwanted surprises, like the one I described at the beginning, and made the game far more tactical. Well, sounds good, right? But here's how this solution occasionally backfires. Characters just shoot through walls. It's not that frequent, but we got a lot of flack from that, a lot of negative feedback. So in order to fix systemic design issues, it's good to go back in time and analyze your trail of thought step by step. You'll usually find a couple of weak links and weak points that you could improve. So we wanted the player to have more information. And for tactical gameplay in interiors, you need more information about enemy position. But you have to see a character to reveal them. So we broadened the definition of seeing someone. We have the free side steps. And because line of sight equals line of fire, as in if you see someone, you can shoot them. Thus, more unclear cases of line of fire. And there's a, and there's a result of that. Occasionally, characters shoot through walls. So to untangle this situation, you have to like, take a step back and find a point, point that you can deviate from most easily. So for example, we could also reveal enemies that you hear instead of doing free sidesteps, which would probably be a better, cheaper solution. So I have no idea why it came to me like uh, the moment I was writing this talk. So anyway. Um, so there's also a more general lesson to be learned here. So in systemic games, ludonarrative dissonance pertains to rules. So the theme in your game will get the player in a certain mood. And this mood will affect how the player interprets the rules of the game. Because the narrative is built by your systems in, forms, in form of player stories. So game rules should go hand in hand with the game theme. If your theme is realistic, players might expect realistic rules. If your theme is abstract, players will be OK with abstract rules. Uh -huh. Okay, so I wanted to make luck an important pillar of Hard West because it works with the theme, right? Luck is very Wild Westy, and people have a lot of ideas about ex how exactly luck works. And often you can use the common understanding of an abstract concept and make it into a game mechanic. So that's exactly what we did. And Hard West Luck system works like this. That's that's my funny gif. I have one, and this is it. Like. Like you, if you were planning to laugh at some point during this, throughout this presentation, this is, this is the moment. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So characters have luck, and luck helps you dodge shots. When you shoot, target luck is reduced by the amount equal to your accuracy, and when the target's luck is depleted, you hit the target. The reception of this was, in general, very good. It catered to the group of XCOM players who didn't like random number generation, it gives you compelling predictability, it's new, it's fresh, and it sets hardware apart from XCOM, so exactly what we wanted. So we did a similar thing in Phantom Doctrine. As we all know, like real life agents and spies like James Bourne, uh, Jason Bourne and James Bond are trained to have great awareness, constantly aware of their surroundings, they never get surprised by an attack, you need to really wear them down to be able to shoot them, so in Phantom Doctrine, awareness system replaced the lack system. So aware characters can dodge shots when they see them coming. And mathematically, it's almost the same system, but for some reason, a lot of players didn't like it. Why? Like, why did this system, why did this system get good feedback in Hard West, but bad feedback in Phantom Doctrine? Now, consider what is the common standard system for chance to hit. Accuracy is a percentage chance to hit, make a roll lower than that percentage to hit. Simple as that. So hardware straight out lied about this. We added a percentage symbol and called it chance to hit, which it wasn't, like, at all. There, there, there are no random rolls here. And it was far better received because this was a simplification good enough for beginner players and expert players, so right through and appreciated the clockwork mechanic, clockwork mechanic behind it. So how to do it right? Uh, how a system works and how it's presented to the player are two completely different things. How it works is for the power players. How it's presented is for the new players. System mechanics and 
and its presentation are two vastly different things. So in other words, if your new mechanic behaves like something familiar, just make it look familiar. Lie about your mechanics to onboard the new players. And never let your theme confuse the player. The rule of thumb, when in doubt, just clarify the mechanics, even if it will damage your theme. So about balance structure, which is something super complex and that no one knows how to do and sometimes it just works and people have like spreadsheets and shit. So there are two main gameplay layers in fandom doctrine, the tactical and the world map. And in the world map, enemy AI will create events that the player has or chooses to react to. And with almost all event types, one of your options is to start a tactical mission where mission type is determined by the event type. Okay, you got this? We good? Okay. So, for example, if you attack an enemy agent on a mission to find your hideout, you'll have a tactical mission where you have to kill a single enemy agent and hunt them down. Or if enemy is plotting to assassinate an informer of yours, you'll start a mission that is basically a VAP rescue. So we have a decent variety of mission types that are quite different and ideally, uh, given how many mission types there are, there should be variety. And players should, on average, play similar amounts of different missions. Yet we got, obviously, a lot of backlash for repetition and players said it's boring because they only play one mission type over and over. So it turns out uh, with this structure, this could not be fixed because there are two conflicting ideas, balance frequency of world events and balance frequency of tactical missions. Balance in the world map was tied to mission type balance. So when I balanced the frequency of the world map events, I broke the balance of tactical mission variety. World map events could never be equally balanced because they have different frequency and different conditions to be met before they could even appear on the map. So the big lesson here is to just balance systems separately. And ta-da, tactical missions and world map missions should have been just unrelated. Each of those should have been balanced in its own regard, in its own right, and then tied. This obviously would hurt the theme because that's why the connections were there. But always watch out for situations where theme affects the balance because they will be problematic. Okay, so we wanted the game to be possibly endless at any point, okay? So you don't have to proceed unless you want to. You can collect loot, you can gather secrets, you can level up your agents, and when you feel ready, you can move on. Like, no pressure. Obviously a lot of pressure because there's like a conspiracy that's plotting to destroy the world, blah, blah, blah. But in terms of gameplay and numbers, no pressure. And our estimate was 40 hours for a campaign playthrough. And the feedback was obviously surprising. So the feedback was it's a boring repetitive, repetitive grind with 100 hour playthroughs. Like, like, what the fuck? Why would the players take more time to go through the campaign and complain about it? Why would they make their path boring and then complain that it's boring? So to untangle this, you must first know how the big campaign loop, how does the big campaign loop works? So the game is split into what we call campaign stages in a string of pearls structure. And campaign stage is the open part between two story missions. That's the loop, okay? Where players can take on generated missions, as many as they want. And for each stage, there's a finite pool of stuff they can find at random, like weapons, new technologies, shit like that. And when player chooses to do so, they proceed to the next story mission, to the next campaign stage where they unlock the new pool of loot. So players can play infinite number of missions 
with finite number of random loot drops and random unlocks. But the problem is, they don't know when they got it all. And they don't know when it's okay, when they should proceed. Now, the reason for this is, well, the player is kept in the dark because that's the theme. You have a spy organization and looking for a secret conspiracy that is like out there somewhere. And they have secret documents. So like, it doesn't make sense to know how many secrets do they have, right? So that's part of the fantasy, not knowing what's out there. But at the same time, players will want to know if they got it all, like in Pokemon, probably, or something, if they accomplished the goal. So clearly communicate game states of a theme. Uh, Well-paced means something completely different for every player. So just tell the player when it's OK to proceed, simply put. Um, okay, systems based on theme. So in Phantom Doctrine, we have this super, super cool feature called investigation work, which I'm super proud of. You're supposed to love it when you play it. So you collect bits of information, files, photos, and you make the connections to figure out the key information, like who's the bad guy, and so on, so on. So the feedback is pretty good. Like, this is just like the movies. Should have made this a GIF as well. Anyway, um, so we put a lot of effort to turn this prototype into something good. It still felt wrong. It was, it, was, um, the, it was papers out of scale laid out on a desk, connected with abstract lines. So, you know, not looking crazy at all, like, at all. So then it, it, it would turn it into something much better that would deliver the right fantasy with the right details. So with themes, details are super important. And to do this right, you need to pick one interaction that you want to simulate for your player and really get to the bottom of it. So for example, in Ace Attorney, the key interaction is finding the contradiction in the statement, right? But you don't have to learn the law, right? It's really simplified. And it's really, it really boils down to one simple interaction. So find the winning game style. Okay, actually, you have one more funny GIF. I find it very funny. Uh, so find the, find the winning game state and the failing game state that you feel, that feel just right. You have to get these moments right because these key moments will deliver your theme. Because everyone who played Ace Attorney recognizes exactly that. Maybe not that well. You get the idea. Uh, so this went right. We got the fantasy right with correct details. What it really means to do, to perform this act, investigation board is about connecting related things. But of course, there were other issues with this. So again, a lot of backlash. So on average, about 20 hours into the game, players no longer were surprised by the content it provided and got bored. So we kind of anticipated that. And we feared that the players will grow tired of it because obviously there was a finite number of content in it, although it was generated from pieces, but still. So we made it possible to automate and skip the whole thing. Okay, so you can assign your agents to do this for you. And when you look at the achievement stats, at least 91% of players did use the skip mechanic, which sounds about right, but it's like super wrong because players wanted to play this so much, not to skip it, right? So they wanted it to not get boring in any foreseeable future. So the problem here, the longevity of the feature. So there are two conflicting ideas, two conflicting goals here. One, players can solve infinite number of case files on the investigation board and it never gets boring, which is you know impossible because everything will get boring eventually. Players will plow through any amount of content you can prepare and eventually it will get boring and they will whine that it got boring and it's your fault that they played it too much because it's so good, so good. But anyway, uh, so the solution here, so how to do is right, is write out how many times the feature is supposed to ideally show up in your game. It is not a number, yeah? Three is a number, three thousands is a number and plan exactly how much content in that feature do you need for this many uses of this feature. 
and plan precisely how many, how many actions the players will perform, how many times they will see a piece of information, and encourage and reward the players to stick to your schedule. Or, well, if you don't want it, you can always like, enforce it. Because you need to keep the audience hungry for more. Like, if I, for example, if I knew the best, the, like, the number one magic trick in the world, and you saw it once, you'd love it, probably. Well, assuming it's good. But if I showed, you, uh, if I showed the trick to you over and over, 100 times, uh, then you'd get to the point where you'd say, well, it's not that impressive, really. It's kind of boring, even. In order for your gameplay mechanics to be magical, keep the audience hungry for more and carefully plan the pacing. Systems adjusted for theme. Like these, these details are really bad, but there's like version 3.0 and they're like so much better than they used to be. Anyway, Phantom Doctrine has this feature called, called support powers. So before the mission, you can assign agents to support powers, like sniper or spot stuff like that. You can place them outside the mission area. And gameplay-wise, these are just very simple direct global cast abilities with a nice cutscene. They were super cheap. So it went well because it was just enough. It's a very, very simple system, very cheap system with simple directional cast abilities and cheap cutscenes, really relatively, because we reused a lot of content for that and that character in the cutscene is the it has like the visuals of the agent that you assigned to do this. Uh, so the lesson learned. So the final effect was exactly the same as the first trivial prototype that we did, plus all the bells and whistles. And the prototype was very effective and perfectly accurate. So too often prototypes we all make have very little in common with the final result. And the more they differ, the more messy the production is bound to be. So make sure your prototype is exactly the gameplay you intend to have and not like half of it. Prototypes should, prototypes should always be abstract. Making a feature fit the theme is so much easier than making a good feature. Uh, it's easy to convince yourself and the team to a bad mechanic that is wrapped in a good theme. So remember, first the gameplay, and second the game, the, a coat of theme paint. So every theme is a context in which words mean different things. To initial, the, the initial goal for a feature we had called simultaneous, sim, simultaneous, simultaneous orders uh, was to provide change in the based monotony. So the idea was to give the player an option to act out orders simultaneously. Players could give out any orders to all agents and have them do them uh, have them do it all at once. Now the problem is, it, was, it wasn't particularly good at anything. So sure, I can do a couple of things at once, but why would I? Like it even takes more clicks this way. So like no one used it. And second, if your game is turn-based, assuming create a real-time mechanic is a technical nightmare. So we narrowed it down to a single context a single use, and we called it breach, which means have all your agents enter and shoot everyone at the same time, basically. That was, that's what this word now means in the context of Phantom Doctrine. And it's useful because it counters uh, Overwatch, counters uh, the enemy defense, and they won't like trigger when you come in. And it's just three clicks, so it's actually less clicks than if you were to do step by step. So you just choose to breach, choose the room, and confirm, that's it. Now, because that's what it means in this theme, to enter a room simultaneously and neutral, neutralize everyone in range. So how to do this right? Make one use case work perfectly well, and like, if you've got the money, do more, but ask yourself this, can your feature be shown in importantly experienced at the push of a button, and can you name it like the right way to be part of the fantasy and not just a feature like tacked on top of the game? Uh, okay, so last part. Oh wow, I'm perfect. So in a setting that fully depicts 
a realistic situation or context, you'll be constantly wondering how far can you go with your own inventions. So it's like biography movies where usually, where usually the plot falls apart somewhere towards the end because no real life is like written accord with the like three act structure and so on. So give your setting a unique spin, spin to allow for anything you desire. You need to give yourself means to channel any loose ends into where unresolved logic problems die. So for example, in Phantom Doctrine, it's a game about spies, but also have a massive worldwide conspiracy going on. And the key mediums here are, this could happen because it, he was brainwashed, for example, and no one knows how exactly brainwashing works because it's like kind of fantasy, allegedly, who knows. But anyway, and the conspiracy theories, they were all true all along. So we're suckers for conspiracy theories and a small part of us all wants them to be true. And in case of Hard West, it's Wild West, but with like demons and the occult. So we made the assumption that the world of Hard West is where all myths and legends were true. And when you do that, like any idea you have will because you know it doesn't have to like make sense. That is it. Thank you. Thank you, Casper. If you have a question for Casper, please come to the mic in the middle aisle. We've got a, we've got time for a couple questions, and uh, I've got one myself to start things off. Um, hey, so Ryan. Hi. <laughs> yes, I'm Ryan. Uh, my question is about the difference between Hard West and Phantom Doctor, and you talked about how you had such a larger team and things for the second game and so many more features and whatnot. What do you think the result would have been if you'd kept it the same scale as Hard West? Do you think you know, the review scores and things like that would have been about the same? It's like, was all that extra effort, um, you know, did it amount to something? Okay, so given how many times I was so wrong guessing how a game will do, and not even, I'm not talking only our games, but like all the games in general, that like, I have no fucking clue. Like, <laughs> could be perfect, could be next to nothing, no idea. Yeah. Yeah. But there's, like, once we're here, like, given that we're at this topic, so there's one thing that we could have done, like, mid production to avoid many of the issues because we didn't adapt for the pace at which we were able to hire people. Hmm. And that was one of the, um, one of the biggest problems in the development. That, you know, we needed to like develop the game, but we didn't have the, the whole team yet. Right. And, like, like, so, yeah. Yeah. So for future games, if you made a game in a similar genre again, would you do a similar sort of thing, like go in the full sort of XCOM route? So, in our new studio, that is super cool. Uh, what we do is we the, the scope can 100% be delivered by the team we have right now. Okay. And we, if we get more, then we use the expansions that I talked about, okay. and we can always do more. But like, we definitely can deliver what we have in, in like, what we have, what the plan is, with who's on board. Right, okay, and with your, with your new game, are you, are you, you know, planning the gameplay first or the theme first? Are you doing what you, what you mentioned? Well, we usually do this at the same time. Same time. So it's a gameplay plus theme, and it has to work together really well. Awesome. Question? Yeah, it's actually related to that uh, last question you just asked, which is when you're starting a game, uh, you made a really good point, which was when you prototype, don't put art in it, because that will trick you, just do the gameplay. Um, but can you talk about how you develop a game from the ground up? Like, if, it's not, if theme is a big part of your like idea origination for a game, do you do art tests in parallel with gameplay prototypes, or how does that process come together in the beginning? Okay, so. Um Sorry. Should I repeat the question? Or no, it's, it's, it's recorded. recorded if it's All right, there's a yeah. little, right. So uh, the process more or less goes like this. First, like in general, I really don't like waiting for ideas to happen. So I usually like steal ideas, I refactor ideas, I reuse ideas, and maybe no one will notice, whatever. But I try not to wait for ideas, apart from game ideas, where I just look for, or actually, wait for ideas to come for uh, pairs of gameplay, like base gameplay mechanic 
and theme. Mm. That was the case with Hard West, where the theme works really well with this gameplay because you know it's kind of empty. The, yeah. The, like the towns are small and it makes sense. There's not many people around, the buildings are low and so on, so on, so on. And the combat is slow paced as well. Yeah. So that's like step number one. And then we note down all the possible ideas we might have. A lot of them are stolen, obviously, from games, from movies. And we make a huge fucking list of stuff that we could possibly have in the game. And the rule of thumb is we try to like, get it all in. in some way, like for example, um, for Hard West, we wanted to have some, you know, poker cards in the game. But obviously, it's like the the most obvious idea would be to put in a mini game, which would be super fucking expensive. And why would we do that in a turn-based tactical game? So we used the cards to represent character abilities in character development system, mm -hmm. and it works pre pretty well. Yeah? So that's that's okay. that's the process, more or less. Cool. Thanks. All right, last question. Oh, yeah. So in your presentation, it seems like try to identify the problems and get the, get the solutions you think might fit, and it turns like it's become better. So what if you are carrying the current experience and transfer, tra transfer yourself back to the past? So you are basically, are you going to do the same thing faster, or is there something else you want to do? Um, so I definitely would like to come back to this genre at some point. Uh, but like, there's so many games I could make, I would like to make, so. But the thing is, um, I always try to do a like, really solid postmortem that is like, super critical and super negative, because I believe that either you succeed or you learn, and there's like, a lot of learning here. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of unrelated to our future plans. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Make sure you fill out your email survey forms to let Casper if know you what you it. thought. If you liked <laughs> it's it. only if you liked it. Only if you liked it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Casper.